the solo run. Everyone's favorite. Ooh, screw the long-winded intro. He all read the title. Today, I'm calculating which Pokemon is statistically the best to solo run Kanto. Richard, hit that intro. For anyone who doesn't know what a solo run is, uh, you remember that thing you did when you were a kid when you were like, oh, oh cool, I can use up to six Pokemon at once? Let me chuck five of those slots in the trash real quick. Basically, a solo run means that you could only use one Pokemon for the entire game. Most people call it a challenge run, though if we're being honest, pulling every single XP point in the game into one single Pokemon makes you super overleveled fast, and it's basically like playing the game on easy mode regardless of which Pokemon you choose. But which Pokemon would make it the easiest of easy modes? Which single Pokemon? could bring the Kanto region to its knees as it bows before its new undefeated champion. Today, I'm breaking down all the math to answer that very question. Ah, crap, I guess I did kind of do the intro. I'm gonna be looking at Pokemon Fire Red and Leaf Green specifically because, well, let's be honest, they're the only Kanto games that are actually good. Our goal is to find the one single Pokemon that can most effectively handle any Pokemon you'll come across in your adventures. Now, the first problem with using one Pokemon for every single battle is that, well, there's only so many Pokemon you can get before your first battle. Sure, beating the whole game with an Omastar sounds pretty cool, but good luck getting to Cinnabar without fighting anyone. To make it a bit more interesting, let's say that you can trade in any Pokemon you want at the earliest opportunity and use that for your solo run. In Fire Red and Leaf Green, you're not able to trade in any National Dex Pokemon until completing a quest on the Sevi Islands, so that means that only the original 151 Pokemon are eligible. I'm also going to go ahead and ban any legendaries, because we already know that Mewtwo is going to stop the whole game with its base stats alone, and that's kind of boring. Uh, finally, I'll allow you to use other Pokemon solely for the purpose of HMs. You need a bunch of them to traverse the Kanto region, and if we truly only allowed one Pokemon in the party for the whole game, then this would become a video about googling who can learn all the HMs. And again, that's not very interesting. So, with those three in mind, it's time to math! The goal here is to find out which single Pokemon can most easily defeat as many other Pokemon as possible. The best way to deal big damage of Pokemon is by having a type advantage. Now, my first idea was to figure out which type is super effective against the most Pokemon from Kanto, but I realized that it's not that simple. In Kanto, there are certain Pokemon that show up all the time, and there are others that you will literally never encounter in a regular battle, and weighting them the same wouldn't be fair. What we really need to know is which Pokemon is the most effective against all the Pokemon that you will actually have to fight in the game. And finding that is a little more tricky. Because you see, in order to find out what all the Pokemon that you actually fight are weak to, you first need to know exactly how many of each Pokemon you'll actually be fighting, excluding random wild Pokemon, because that would actually be impossible to calculate and you can just run away from them anyway. That means that we need a list of every single trainer in the game and all of the Pokemon on their team. Now, I was hoping that there would be some super comprehensive list on Bulbapedia or something, but alas, I was out of luck. Bulbapedia had no such list. But just when I was about to give up, a savior descended upon me, an angel reaching across time with the very answers I sought. All the way from 2005, the man, the myth, the legend, 
some guy named June on GameFAQs has done the impossible. He has compiled a list of every single trainer and every single Pokemon that was on their team. June, if you're still out there, my friend, we salute you. With this list and a ton of command effing, I was able to count how many of each Pokemon you'll encounter if you fought every single trainer in the game, which I put into a spreadsheet. For those curious, the most common Pokemon you'll run into in a typical Kanto game is coughing. So, you know, thanks for all that global warming, Team Rocket. Now I have this list, but we still need to know which types are the most effective against the most Pokemon. Luckily, I've been doing this for a while, and I've compiled spreadsheets with just about every piece of Pokemon data you could ever want, including one with all the type interactions for every single Pokemon in the game. So I grabbed the first 151 and copied them into my new sheet. But we do have an eensy weensy little issue. The table contains all the multipliers. So a two times multiplier for weaknesses and a 0.5 multiplier for resistances and a one for neutral damage. We don't really care about the multipliers right now though. We just care about how many Pokemon are weak to each type. To resolve this issue, well, I'm sorry to all my fellow engineers, but I had to do something that I'm not proud of. I had to dip into the dark side, and I, well, well, you see, I had to, I had to write some code. Ugh, gives me the chills. Uh, granted, it was literally, literally one line of code, and it was dumb. I think this barely even counts as code. It's so freaking easy, but I swore an oath when I got my degree that I would never even utter the word if statement because all my engineering homies know that that sh is lame. For those who didn't go to engineering school and don't know all the intricacies of the rivalries between engineers and computer science people, uh, spreadsheet software lets you write out equations and very simple lines of code to do a bunch of math for you. So this keyboard smash looking thing here is basically just looking at the first table of multipliers and if that value is less than or equal to zero, it will just set it to be zero. We're not interested in resistances or neutral damage now, so we can just throw those out. If the value is greater than one, then in our case, it has to be two for a weakness or four for a Pokemon that is double weak to a type. So if we just take those and divide them by two, then every Pokemon that is weak to a type will have a one listed in the table under the types that they're weak to. This does mean that we'll double count Pokemon with four times weaknesses, which I think is fine. Those are pretty helpful. So just in case I lost anyone, now we have a table where every Pokemon will have a one under the types that they're weak to and a zero everywhere else. Now we can multiply every column here by the number of Pokemon in that row that we recorded in the first column. So as an example, a Rattata has a weakness to fighting and there are 31 Rattatas in the game. So that means that there are 31 Pokemon weak to fighting based on just the Rattata alone. If we do that for every Pokemon and then add up every single column, then we can find out how many Pokemon are weak to each type across the whole game. I went ahead and color coded them to make them easier to see, and from this data we can see that normal is the worst type offensively for, well, obvious reasons, it's not strong against anything, followed by dragon and then poison. Which really makes you wonder, what even was the point, Team Rocket? I mean, it wasn't even that helpful. I put a link in the description with all the data if you want to have a look for yourself, but from this we can see that Psychic is super effective against the most individual Pokemon across the whole game. Thanks pretty much exclusively to Team Rocket and the 33 Machokes that randomly show up, which is a weirdly huge number compared to everything else. So right off the bat, a strong psychic type should be able to carry you through huge portions of this game. 
Psychic Pokemon also have the added benefit of learning a whole bunch of random TMs. Like, seriously, it's a weird trend among Psychics where you're constantly like, well, well, yeah, I guess, uh, I guess they can learn that. Might as well throw it on there. Doesn't make sense. Let's get it on. This means that you'll be able to get a whole bunch of different coverage moves depending on what part of the game you're at. A strong electric move is especially important thanks to the large number of water types and birds that you'll fight. And by birds, I mean exclusively the Pidgey line. These guys are freaking everywhere. There is one problem though, and that's that Psychic is pretty trash defensively, and all the monotype Psychic Pokemon are either garbage, useless at early levels, or banned. So we need to find out which dual typing would be the most helpful at not dying. Now, you're probably thinking right now, surely he doesn't already have a spreadsheet from a past video with this too, but that's where you're wrong. I do have a spreadsheet calculating how good each and every type combination is from both an offensive and defensive perspective. You fool! Now, according to my data, a Psychic and Steel type would be the most ideal, but Metagross isn't available until late game, even with trades. So, of the dual types that are actually available in Kanto, a Psychic and Water type is the most ideal. That leaves us with just two Pokemon to pick from. Slowbro is pretty bulky and hits decently hard, but is very slow. On the other hand, Starmie is much faster, stronger, evolves way earlier, has better TMs, and is just all around the superior option. So yeah, the answer is Starmie. Probably should have made that a more dramatic reveal or something. If you get yourself a Star U right at the beginning of the game, and eventually evolve it into a Starmie with Surf, Psychic, Thunderbolt, and some other rotating move like Ice Beam, Confuse Ray, or Toxic, depending on what part of the game you're at, then you'll basically be able to run through every single trainer you meet. The late game especially, you'll absolutely cook, though there are a few challenges early game that are worth talking about. Namely, Lieutenant Surge and Erika, who both have type advantages against you. Erika isn't actually all that bad, because Celadon City is also home to the department store, where if you got the cash, you can buy a Water Stone to evolve your Staryu into a Starmie, and you can get the TM for Blizzard or Ice Beam from the game corner. You can even get the T and gain access to Saffron City right now, which is where you can find the TM for Psychic. Since most grass Pokemon are also poison in this game, then you should have more than enough tools and levels by this point to run through Erica's team. The real challenge will be even getting to her, because Lieutenant Surge is going to be one tough nut to crack. Staryu gets no ground moves whatsoever, and because Surge is so early in the game, you won't have a ton of tools to be able to deal with him yet. Well, if you're a dummy, then you won't have any tools, because at level 19, Staryu learns the move Camouflage. Ordinarily, this move is pretty useless, but in this one specific instance, it's going to save the run. Camouflage will change you into a new type depending on where you are, and inside a gym, it will make you a normal type. So you might not be able to hit Surge super effectively, but if you're fast enough, neither will he. Lieutenant Surge leads with a Voltorb, which is significantly faster than Staryu, so there is a very good chance that it will go first. But as long as you're on par with his ace level-wise, which you honestly should have far surpassed by now if you're funneling all the XP into one Pokemon, then you can live a super effective shockwave as long as it's not a crit, at which point you can use camouflage, get rid of that weakness, pop a potion, and let a newly stabbed Swift carry you to victory. And once you walk out of that gym with your shiny new badge, it's basically a cakewalk to the champion. A Starmie with Surf, Psychic, Thunderbolt, and Ice Beam can destroy Erika, Koga, 
explain literally all of Team Rocket, Giovanni, Lorelai, Bruno, and Lance. You resist Sabrina, and while you may think that Agatha's ghost types would be a problem, that old hag is actually a liar. She is not a ghost type trainer. Literally, her whole team is poison type. And it always has been. As for the champion, if you chose Bulbasaur for your starter, then your rival's team will look like this. You can Ice Beam the Pidgeot and Executor, Thunderbolt the Gyarados, Surf the Charizard and the Rhydon, and by this point you'll be so over leveled that you can just muscle your way through Alakazam. And just like that, you and your Starmie have carved your names into the halls of history. The most famous, or perhaps infamous, trainer in the region. And there you have it. The single Pokemon that is statistically the most well-equipped to turn the Kanto League to dust is Starmie. You may run into a few challenges early game, but as long as you're well prepared, you have all the tools you need to succeed. And once you've reached Celadon City, it's game over. If you like this video, then let me know by hitting that subscribe button, because who knows? I might have the Johto region in my site next. <laughs>A massive thanks to everyone who supports me on Patreon, including Alakazam, Ethan Ferlano, and Sherry and Mark. You all get one star. Get it? Get it once one star? Cause it's a cause it's a solo run and it's and it's Starmie?